Well, he left the columnist business for a while. He's back at the New York Post. Four New York Times bestsellers. Uh, the last one we spent a great deal of time on was The Rise and Reign of Mike Krzyzewski. You can always order that. Amazon, all places you can order books. We bring him on as often as we can. He just got back from Maui and is a West Coast guy. That's like across the street. But for an East Coast guy, he was on a plane 13 hours with his lovely wife, who I've met, celebrating their 30th wedding anniversary. So I've been married 15. So I want you to our to our audience. What is the secret, seriously, to a 30-year marriage? <laughs> well, I know people who've been married a lot longer than that, so I probably am not qualified to, to answer a question about the secret to long-term success in a marriage. But just find someone who is your best friend and never forget to treat her or him that way for, for the rest of your life. So uh, I've always really focused more, I think, on our friendship than, than just about anything else. So hopefully I've been a, a really, really good friend to her. I know she's been a terrific friend to me, and I think that's sort of been at the core of our relationship. Yep. I Anne is my best friend and um, knows all my faults, and there are many, So and she reminds me of them <laughs> regularly. So, you know, so great to be in a... It is really great to be in a great marriage. I You know, not to sound... Uh, you know, like an old an old guy uh, barking at all you young single peeps listening to our podcast, but it's an amazing place in our lives. It sure is. So of the many things to talk about, um, you know, oftentimes New York teams, especially in baseball, Steve Cohen has made the Mets a bit of a villain by having a payroll that's more than the bottom seven teams in the sport. And the Yankees have always had that sort of image, although I found the Yankees... You know, the Reggie Jackson, Billy Martin uh, Yankees, so vulnerable and so likable, even as a Seattle kid. I loved those teams. They always had quirky characters and real personality, despite Stein, even the owner was crazy. I find the Knicks incredibly likable. Thibodeau is an old school guy. Brunson got sent off by the Mavs. He, they didn't understand how good he was. You know, the Lakers ran off Julius Randle because in a world of threes, he hits twos. And I got to tell you, I think they're going to knock somebody off. Um, I like their roster. I think they're a, I think they're another star away. But Ian, I, I think if you send them up against a Philadelphia, um, I don't know if they could keep pace with Cleveland's offense. But kind of give me your forecast of the Knicks as a playoff team. I agree, Colin. I actually think the only two teams they cannot beat in the East are Boston and Milwaukee in a seven-game series. I actually think they'll push those teams the way they're playing now, and they're getting better. They've got one of the better coaches in the NBA and Tibbs, as you mentioned. Brunson is so much better than I thought he was going to be. I, I now believe after watching him, I, I admit it's a bit of a small sample size, but I do think you can win a championship with him as your second-best player. I, I think he's I do, too. I do. Yep. And I, I don't think you can win. I don't think you can have a dynasty with him. I, I certainly think you can pick one or two off. And he's only, what, he's 26 years old. I, I think he's smart enough to, to know he's got a really good thing in New York. New York City is a place that loves point guards for whatever reason. Always yeah. has. High school, college, and pro. And yet the Knicks haven't had one <laughs> long term who was really good since Clyde Frazier. So it's been a long right. time. And finally... The Knicks have a quarterback who can lead them consistently to the playoffs and maybe on some deep runs. I think they will beat Cleveland in the first round if that's the matchup. I wouldn't be surprised if the Knicks hurdle the Cavaliers and get that four seed and home court advantage in the first round. I, I think they can certainly win that series. I think there's a shot they could upset Philly. I, I think where it ends is Boston, Milwaukee, wherever that series happens in the playoffs, they'll lose that series. But that, that's a really good step from where they were last year when it seemed like Tibbs's program was unraveling after a really good year one. So um, Brunson's injections, obviously key. There is a sense around um, all sports. There are certain franchises where you have to overcome the owner. That's always been a feeling with James Dolan. Give me the person inside the organization that has orchestrated most of this, not a player, but because Dolan has, um, you know, a reputation, fair or not. Um, who's, 
Who's behind the scenes? Who's the puppeteer? Who's making these moves in the front office? Because I've always, you always hear the same four or five names. You tell me the hierarchy. Who's the key? I think you have to go to, to Leon Rose. I mean, people talk about World Wide West being one of the more mysterious figures in all of basketball and his connections. But I think, and, and listen, World Wide West and Leon Rose, they've been a bit of a partnership over the years. They've made their share of mistakes, certainly, without question. You look at Fournier, you look at Kemba Walker, and, yeah. and Rose actually gave uh, Tibbs some players he didn't want, Reddish. And they had to send out a first-round pick to get Reddish and then send out another first-round pick to get rid of him. So th they've made their share of mistakes. But Leon Rose is the guy who – made one of the best acquisitions I've seen in New York in any sport in, in many years. And that was Brunson. He yeah. got that done. He had the relationship to get it done through the family, his rep representation as well. And so now having, you said, don't name a player. I think it's impossible not to name Brunson because I think he's going to draw free agent, significant NBA veterans e either yeah. through a trade or free agency who now want to play with a, with a point guard who looks at the big picture. Now, listen, yep. he just had 30 points and a half against the Nets, and he finished with 39. He he was not interested in, hey, let me try to hang 50, 55, 60 on these guys. He only cares about winning. He, he should have been an all-star, and he wasn't. And he was genuinely happy for Julius Randle after he went through a miserable season with the fans and everything else last year that he personally helped resurrect his career and make him an all-star again. He, he didn't just say that. It, it looked to me and a lot of people around the Knicks that he really meant it. So his generosity of spirit, the way he plays, his body language, the way he runs the team, I think is going to draw better players and put the Knicks finally in position to win a championship. Well, it's funny. Luca couldn't work with Porzingis. Porzingis has actually been pretty good since leaving him. Brunson's a star. He's not winning now with Kyrie as there's a, there's a James Harden quality to Luka where he's a remarkable score, but a bit ball-centric. And so I think, I think that it was really a catch. And I think the Knicks deserve a lot of credit. I think they're relatable. Um, I, think they, I think they really, you know, Julius Randle's a fascinating player. So I was in, like in Los Angeles when he was a Laker. He comes out of Kentucky and the league was really, in transitioning to a three-point league. It was the beginning of the Golden State stuff. And I can remember having a discussion with somebody inside the Lakers and they're like, he's going to make a really good player for somebody. We're not sure it's the Lakers. But you know what I'll give Julius Randle credit for? He mostly, Ian, knows what he is and what he's not. He has worked on his game. I think he's a lot better offensive player than the league thought he was going to be. I mean, he was a great high school player, very good at Kentucky. If I if I had never watched Julius Randle and I said, hey, Ian, his numbers are pretty good. Describe him. How would you describe him? He did shoot, I believe it was 41% from three two years ago. Of course, a lot of that was empty gyms in the pandemic. And, and so some people subtracted uh, from that performance from, from three-point range. But I, I think he's a guy who is a load offensively. And, and you're right. He's got a little bit of an old school game. But I think he's also given a lot of credit to Brunson for bringing him back. Remember last year, he fought with the fans. He fought with everybody. He had this great first year with Tibbs and yeah. helped really gave New Yorkers a, a gift really during the pandemic. The fact that the Knicks were competent again and, and just playing some winning basketball had been so long. I mean, really for the better part of two decades, the Knicks had been a dysfunctional product. And so Randall, I thought, would never, ever have to pay for a meal or a drink ever again in the five boroughs. But then last year, all of a sudden, it all fell apart on him. It looked like he was going to get traded. He was going to play and complain his way out of town. And then he came back this year. He worked out in the offseason. Brunson really helped bring him back. And listen, remember, Colin, when the Knicks signed him in 2019, after missing out on Kevin Durant and to some degree Kyrie, they had to apologize to their fan base. Steve Mills, then the team president, apologized for the consolation pieces that he signed because they were supposed to get Kevin Durant and maybe Kyrie Irving. And they struck out and lost out to the Brooklyn Nets. They get Julius Randle, who has done a lot for that organization, will continue to do that. And they basically had to apologize for signing him. So right. he's come a long way. And, and I think he deserves a lot of credit for the kind of bounce back he had off of last year. 
So um, I've said before is that I've always viewed the Maras as a reasonably good ownership group, um, you know, mostly pretty stoic. They stay out of the headlines. Uh, I don't think they're as um, as impulsive sometimes as the, the Johnson family and the Jets um, or Dolan can be. Um, I, I tend to think they're a little methodical. Uh, you know, they gave uh, Tom Coughlin, there was a couple of years it was pretty lean at the end. And then, listen, nobody would have guessed Coughlin out of Boston College would have been that good. They, they whiffed on some guys. Um, and I my takeaway is they see in Daniel Jones, even physically, aesthetically, they see Eli. And they know how long it took for Eli. And they see a really good kid from the South, um, hard worker, doesn't make headlines, stays out of trouble, committed to the process. And I think they they see Brian Dable as kind of this Tom Coughlin. It's like we found this gem, and it's a little rough around the edges, but he's our Tom Coughlin. You know, they always say about New York. It's got its issues, but it, New Yorkers, those problems, those are our problems. And it's like Coughlin was you know, purple as a plum, he's screaming, but he adapted. And Dayball still feels at times he's as emotional as a coordinator, but it works. And so I think they are committed to Daniel Jones. I think there's limitations. Um, here's the rub, though. Running backs getting second contracts, it's bad business. If you pay Saquon and Daniel, you're going to have $60 bucks in the backfield. Uh, that's going to hamper free agency. Um, and that defensive line's not cheap, Ian. Where do you go? Do you, what would you do? Where, what do the fans want? Because I think most New Yorkers know. You won a playoff game. Two of his best games were against the Vikings, a horrific defense. There's, there's a ceiling here. But I think the Maras are in on him. I think they see Eli. I really do. That's my perception outside. You give me your, kind of, your feeling about how the Maras... What do you do with Daniel? What do you do with Saquon? What do the fans want? I do think the fans want both of them back. And it's kind of funny. I, uh, Daniel Jones, he had 15 touchdown passes this year. He, he did run for 7-2, and that, that counts for something. Yeah. He ran for 700 yards. His athleticism is the difference maker between Eli Manning was the better player and the better quarterback. Daniel is much more athletic than Eli, but he has a lot of similarities yes. in the things you talked about. Certainly, they were both coached by, by Cutcliffe. I think that to see Daniel Jones asking for more than what Aaron Judge is now making with the Yankees, who would have thought that on Labor Day, right? <laughs> that Daniel Jones, who nearly was run out of town, was a couple of bad games away from being run out of town, now asking for more than $40 million a year, which is obviously what Judge got long term. So I think when you look at the 15 touchdown passes this year, and right, some of his limitations as a, as a pocket passer – Wow. But I, I think they'll they'll pay him thirty eight million dollars a year because wow. second tier quarterbacks, that's what they the market suggests they should get. I think he'll get thirty seven, thirty eight, maybe thirty nine. I don't think he'll get forty and he'll be your quarterback for the next three to four years. I think Saquon's more interesting because. He is, uh, you're talking about running back on a second contract. He was number two overall pick by a different general manager, but he is a very good player. I actually think, Colin, he's one of three players on the entire roster you could say could be or will be the best in the world at what he does. Andrew Thomas, Dexter Lawrence, and Saquon Barkley. He's much better, Barkley is at his position, at his job, than Daniel Jones is at his, but he happens to play the yeah. wrong position. The way Mara loves both those guys because they represent the organization the way he wants it represented. Saquon Barkley is, is a perfect, he's like Frank Gifford. He's got the Hollywood looks. He He's a giant. He just, the way he carries himself, the way he works, and he's a great player. And so he's just at the wrong position. I think they can, I, I was told by a source that during the bye week, the Giants offered him three years at 12 million a pop. Another source told a colleague of mine, Ryan Dunleavy, it was more, 12.5, maybe over four, but in that 12 to 12.5 range, to me, I'd feel comfortable paying Saquon Barkley 13 per in a in a multi-year deal. And I think they'll come to an agreement. He he doesn't want to be tagged. And I've talked to a source close to him who said he really, really doesn't want to be tagged. So they yeah. can do it and then still work on a long-term deal. I, I think both will be back. 
I don't think it'll be a 60 million total, but you're talking maybe what 38 for Daniel, maybe 13 for Saquon. It's it's quite a an investment in your backfield, but I think it's one that John Mara will make. Well, and also, <clears throat> you can see what's happening. Uh, the Jets may have a great defense, but if you can't get quarterback figured out in 2023, it doesn't matter. It just doesn't matter. You know, I mean, you know, it's Ian, it's it's interesting. The Bears have a defensive coach, last place. Houston defensive coach, last place. Jets defensive coach, last place. Um, uh, I'm missing a couple. Um, uh, uh, Cleveland, uh, I, I think, I think, well, I'll, I'll keep it at that. I think it's very, very... I thought Sean McDermott got completely worked. Completely, utterly worked uh, in that playoff game against Zach Taylor in Cincinnati. And so, you know, I, here's where I feel good about the Giants. They have a coach on the right side. Um, their stars are... I mean, I, I, Dexter Lawrence. I think Thibodeau is actually... Most edge rushers in the history of the sport, Ian, come with ego. It's a vanity position. Like, how is he viewed in New York? I like him. I, I like his attitude. I like. I really do like him. Uh, wh- which player? How, how is Kayvon? Kayvon. Yeah, I think he, he, New York will accept that as long as you perform, as you know. And and so, listen. I I thought it was a a positive and productive year one. There's nothing wrong with personality, and and I think it just has to come along with results. I think he delivered in year one. It's going to be interesting to see him his career as it unfolds in this market and uh he's he can be quirky and that that can work in a big way in terms of marketing himself away from the field in new york but you have to produce and if you don't and you go the wrong way that can really work against you so personality in new york is fine it's 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 not only accepted it's it's welcomed as long as you produce and he did that in year one i think yeah so across town with the Jets, you go into a draft. Um, they need a left tackle and they need a quarterback. Um, you know, there's a lot of rumors on, you know, who they're going to land. To me, it can get really ugly really fast. If I'm Derek Carr, I look at the NFC South and I think, can I beat out, you know, Andy Dalton and Desmond Ritter and Sam Darnold? I mean, it's, it's a pretty meager lot. I could go there with Frank Reich and that defense. I could win the division. For a kid that had to go to Fresno State, was overlooked by Pac-12 schools, the Raiders showed him the door despite being a life preserver on a sinking ship with multiple coaches in seven, eight years. Um, you know, it, what's funny about Carr, he leads the NFL in fourth quarter comeback since he entered the league, which is a sh- which is a shocking number. It's not Stafford. It's not Aaron Rodgers or Brady. Um, the Jets are interesting. Um defensive coach don't have a left tackle it's not a winning culture who do you think they land because if they don't Miami's going to score Buffalo's going to score and it's Belichick it could get really ugly really fast Ian I'm going to put Aaron Rodgers aside for a second let's focus on Derek Carr and Jimmy Garoppolo and Sala has the history in San Francisco with Garoppolo And I actually would favor Jimmy G, and most Jets fans disagree with me on this because of durability concerns with Garoppolo. And Derek Carr is durable. The guy plays 15, 16, now 17 games every year, and Garoppolo does not do that. But Jimmy G's won 70% of his games. He's won four playoff games, and he's he was one or two throws away from winning a Super Bowl. Derek Carr has never won a playoff game. Derek Carr is 16 games, I believe, under 500. He uh, he took the Raiders to one playoff appearance, lost that game. I know people like to compare him now to Stafford. Stafford had never won a playoff game. He goes to the Rams, wins a Super Bowl. But Stafford did lead the Lions to three playoff appearances. Derek Carr only won with the Raiders. And so it's a close call. I can understand both sides. I would favor Garoppolo slightly over Carr. Aaron Rodgers is a different case to me. If you look at, I think, I think Rodgers has a lot to gain by going to the Jets, assuming they win a championship. And it's kind of funny that uh, people in New York have talked about Aaron Rodgers as the guy to bring the Jets back to the Super Bowl for the first time since man walked on the moon, when Rodgers has not been to a Super Bowl in 12 years. So it's kind of, uh, and he's going to be 40 in what, December? And I was there for Brett Favre with the Jets that one year. And 
And people forget they were eight and three. People were talking about a Giants Jets Super Bowl yep. that year. And then he got hurt. And and that was that. It was a one and done proposition. The concern I'd have with Rodgers, is he committed to multiple years? I do think he's somewhat diminished. He's an all time great. So he's still better than the vast majority of quarterbacks in the NFL. So if Rodgers wants it to happen, that the Jets will do it. They'll be all in on Aaron Rodgers. There's no question about that. Obviously, you have to give away assets plus money as opposed to just money to Carr or Garoppolo. But I think if Rodgers decides he wants a new address, the Jets are going all in on that. And if that means giving up considerable assets and a ton of money to pay him, I think they'll do it. Okay, I want to switch to baseball, and obviously hey, we'll Colin, bring you can on. I, can I add one thing about, about Rodgers in New York? Sure. What, what I think is in it for him, legacy-wise, look, Tom Brady has seven rings. He has one, so he's never closing that gap. But if he's the first guy since Joe Namath in January of 69 to win a championship for the Jets in obviously the biggest market, I think that would do a ton for him legacy-wise. And he's now, I, I wouldn't say he's irrelevant, but Patrick Mahomes is now dominating this league. So on two fronts, one against Brady and also against Mahomes, if he could win a title in New York for that organization, I, I think – there's almost more in it for Aaron Rodgers than there is for the Jets. So I think it would have to be a serious consideration for him. Well, and Joe Douglas has hit some real home runs in the draft the last two years. So they're not paying a lot of their best players yet. So if they can land a left tackle in the draft with Rodgers' enormous salary, you know, they're young receivers they're not paying. They're not paying soft, Sauce Gardner. Um, a, a Hall, the excellent, excellent running back out of Aaron Iowa Wilson, State. They're not really paying him. Yeah, so you can you can I always say if it, it all Seattle proved it last year, if you can find four or five starters in a draft, it's amazing what happens to your caps. <laughs> Suddenly the expensive guys don't feel as punitive. Let's pivot to baseball. Uh, we'll bring you on throughout the summer to talk about um, the Mets and Steve Cohen. But I, what's, what I think is fascinating about the Yankees is when they were having much more postseason success, it felt like the manager's job was much more tenuous. Same with the GM. Now they're having less success. Everybody wants Cashman and Aaron Boone gone, and they retain their spots. So the old George, you know, Aaron, Aaron would have been on a Delta flight out of town two years ago. And, and, but here we are. Brian Cashman comes back. Aaron comes back. Do you think the criticisms of both are valid by Yankee fans? Sure. I, I think it gets a little extreme with Cashman. It's amazing. He's been in that job now a quarter of a century. And George threatened to fire him more than 10 times and actually went through with it a couple of times and took him back an hour later. And Brian is a, he's an amazing survivor. That's a hell of a story to, to go that long with the Yankees. And, and yeah, I think some of the criticism is, is certainly justified i think it's been a little extreme with him aaron boone i i think there's a sense of you know how steinbrenner he he wants to sort of stay out of it now he had to get involved with aaron judge he understood if he did not sign judge it was all going to be on him so i think he really acted like his father in that pursuit but for the most part he wants brian cashman to run the family business and sort of keep hal out of it and so Brian has done that. And I think in firing Joe Girardi, he wanted to bring in a user-friendly, player-friendly manager. Yes. And now he wants to double down and triple down and proving that he was right, that Boone was the right guy. And so listen, if they lose early in the playoffs, if they don't win the division, wild card, lose, and and they don't get to at least – the ALCS and at least maybe a game six or seven against Houston, then I think it's possible they'll they'll feel compelled to, to make a move there. But I, I think Boone's going to be around for a little while simply because Cashman wants to do everything he can to, to prove himself right on that decision to fire Girardi and, and go to Boone. And also Hal gives uh, Cashman – just uh, so much leeway in, in running that franchise the way he sees fit that I don't see that ending anytime soon. Yeah, I know Aaron a little bit. Um, you know, baseball fans tend to eat their young. Uh, so much of the analytic world has taken game day lineups 
and decisions out of their hands. So, and I'm for analytics. I think I, I think there's a, a momentum in all sports that data can't track. Uh, I that's always it's it's almost you know the NBA now has this kind of science um, analytics department where like stars are 100 percent pain free like Anthony Davis and he just won't play because they're worried about a stress fracture and it's I think it's um, I think it's uh, it bothers fans. Um, baseball's made some really I think interesting and sharp changes. Finally, they were always reticent for years. I, t- I sat with a double A general manager from Richmond a couple days ago, flying back from Florida, and he said this this shot this pitch clock thing. He said it'll take twenty minutes off your games. And I'm in the car the other day, Ian, and I'm listening to a Dodger game on radio. And I live eight minutes from the grocery store, and they got through an inning. The announcers didn't have time to tell stories and wax poetic. It was just like ball strike, ball strike. I, I like it because I think the iPhone has made us all impatient. We read headlines, not stories. I think the play needs to be more frenetic. How does it land? For, you're more of an old school baseball guy. How does it land for you? Oh, no, I like it a lot. Uh, to me, like three hours is the line of demarcation with baseball. To, I, now, when I'm at a game as a fan in the stands, I, I sort of hope it lasts forever. When I'm working yeah. a game, I feel differently. When I'm watching a game at home, I feel differently. I, the one rule I don't like is the ghost runner on second base and extra innings. I think you can get rid of that. It's too gimmicky to me. But one thing I saw years ago, my son as a teenager, his early teens, and all of his friends would get together in the morning on the weekends and watch Premier League soccer overseas. Yes. And yes. It's two Same hours here. My stepsons it. did it. Yep. And yeah, and that's the first American generation to ever do that. They would actually gather together, watch. It would be like a watch party for Man City against whether it's United or Arsenal. And I was, wow, this is something at age 12, 13, 14, these kids. And part of it was it was a two hour game. You were in and out. And and so I, I and none of them, not one of them would sit and watch a nine inning baseball game. And I, I asked them, and particularly my son, he's like, it's just it's boring, Dad. It's too long. It's, you know, and, and these are kids who play baseball, Little League, all the way yep. through. And they just didn't want to watch a nine-inning baseball game that might take almost four hours. And so I do think it's smart what baseball is doing now. I think it will help tremendously sort of recruit some of these younger fans into the game. And no, I, I might be old school and old fashioned in a lot of ways as it pertains to, to sports, but I'm all in on this one. I, I just wish they'd get rid of that ghost runner because I don't know if they're going to need it as much anymore with the new rules. And I just think that one is a little too gimmicky for, for my taste. Yeah. Maybe do it in the 12th or 13th inning. What they don't want is a Wednesday night game ending at one in the morning where there's right. 18 people in the stands and it just optically looks bad for the record with Ann, her stepsons, Josh and Riley. I had the same experience 15 years ago in the basement of our West Hartford, Connecticut house. I would come down on Saturday mornings we were closer to Boston than New York, and I was shocked. Both my stepsons watched the English Premier League. I had the exact same experience, and I asked them. And, you know, what American fans sometimes don't appreciate um, and is that it's 45-minute halves with no breaks. It's, it's literally, there's a time restriction on it unless you go to penalty kicks. And the truth is, Ian, if it's 4 o'clock in the afternoon and we have a 6.15 dinner reservation, I really appreciate that. <laughs> Absolutely. I, and I, I took my son, Kyle, to a Man City game. He became a Man City fanatic. So we go overseas. And the passion reminded me of college football in the South. I felt like I was at a Georgia-Auburn game. Yep. So uh, it is, uh, it, it's a great game. It, it, I think it's taken this country a long time to really uh, sort of fully appreciate it. But uh, for the lack of scoring, I think was an issue with a lot of American sports fans. But over time, I think that has dissipated. And, and now it's, I see it only getting more popular as we go forward. Ian O'Connor, as always, it's absolutely great seeing you, man. We'll talk a bunch this summer. All right, you too. Thanks, Colin.